I think yeah. you, you're like one of the most productive creatures I know around as far as oh my music or creative music or whatever we want to call it is. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah. You, you know, where do you get all the, I'll start with a stupid question or maybe even not, but where do you have, where do you get all this energy and creativity and where does this come from? Well, uh, I mean, the bottom line is, is that I, I just like making things, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I, that's all I think about. So, mm. you know, I paint as well and yeah, do yeah. sculpture and do video and do uh, drawings and, and write poetry and, uh, or texts and, uh, of course the music stuff. I mean, every morning I wake up, I make a morning, like a morning drone on my uh, modular synthesizers oh, really? just oh. to get a sound going in the house like that kind of defines that's going to define the day define the space define uh, uh, just kind of making a, uh, that first energy burst that um, creates creates a, a beautiful environment in, all, in order to create so um, you know I'm married to one of those beautiful women in the world and we have a dog. Um, we don't have children. Um, I, I wake up and the things I make are, are I try to conjure and bring to life. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's what gives me energy is just trying to, uh, it's kind of a, not necessarily a desperation, but it's definitely a, uh, uh, you know, trying to find things through, through creating. So yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but, but I just love making and making for people to uh, gain energy from. So that, that's what, that's what keeps me going, especially in, in, in the world that seems so chaotic. Yeah. Oh yeah, man. Yeah. Definitely. These days. So, so, to, so I feel it's just my job to create hmm. light and energy in order to, uh, uh, yeah. In order to survive. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wanted to ask you, you, you know, you mentioned the drone thing in the morning. Uh, what, what about your composing? Yeah. You know, I, I listen to Father's Wink a lot lately, and, I, I, you know, I love this quartet of yours. It's just, you know, oh, the, the, the musicians are incredible, and especially your compositions are, like, you know, some of the best stuff. Like, Thank you, man. Really open, and, you know, there are, like, some beautiful, like, that... Father's Wink, which has like amazing harmony and melody. Then you have mm -hmm. Spooled, which is kind of loopish groove thing, but uh, always opening things up and stuff. Like, how how do you proceed with composition? I mean, you just sit down and start messing around with one snippet, or I mean, sort of. I mean, it kind of starts with this thing in the morning where I create a sound, and then the the drawing is informed by the sound and then the painting mm. is informed by the the drawing of the sound and then the video work from that is is uh informed by that and then it comes back to because I, I, I have a sound space and i have a uh, painting sculpture studio so i, I go mm. back and forth from the two places so uh after a kind of a cycle like that uh i might hear something like like an interval or mm. a chord or melodic idea or a burst of noise that gives me the idea to move on um, to a more uh, substantial composition. So mm -hmm. I'll take that, uh, either work with, within Pro Tools or work within, you know, various various softwares or yeah. write it down. My piano is right next to me, so oftentimes I'll be working on something and I'll just simply move, move my hand uh, around the keyboard and uh, around the piano, which is a charged instrument anyway, because I, I inherited uh, Bill Dixon's piano. So Seriously? It's, oh, man. Yeah, so, so it has its own magical quality to it, you know, because oh, wow. I know he handpicked this one and, and, and everything. So it's it's really a, a magical thing. So I, I 
then just start constructing. If I hear something um, interesting, then I'll just go, you know, Mm -hmm. and I have book books and books filled with written material from full melodies to little, like I said, intervallic ideas or chord progressions. And then when I, uh, then when I have a whole book of, of, of these ideas and, and things, um, not to mention everything I've recorded um, from the modular synthesizers and mm, regular yeah. synthesizers, found sound and, and all the different instruments I have in my in my room. Um, I'll start just to put uh, put some stuff together, you know. And uh, so when an, uh, an idea or an opportunity comes up, like uh, like the quartet, for instance, uh, uh, for for Father's Wing, um, I uh, I take all those elements and put them together, mm. you know, and, and, and it just works. But yeah. like, like a song like father's wing, which is very song like, yeah, those type of things just kind of come in one continuous burst. So usually I, I, I just, it just comes to me. So I just sit down at the piano and, uh, uh, move slowly through it until it's as, uh, near to the conception as I, I can possibly get. And then, Mm. Uh, you know, th- and then write it out. Yeah, yeah. Does do that it, answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, do, do, do you write for the players? Like do, when you wrote the, this music, you, you know, did you know you would have Chris and Ingebrigt and Chad? Yeah, yeah. yeah usually, I, 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 well, you, you know, the thing is, is that the snippets and everything I write, like this, this small phrase is is yeah. is not specific. But then when I when I'm putting the stuff together, I think about the specific players. Mm-hmm. I mean, with Chris Davis in particular, um, because she's so amazing. I, 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 you know, for some of the stuff I, I tr- also on desert and Crips volume yeah. one, which, yeah. which, uh, she's amazing. Um, I wrote things that were purpose, purposefully almost impossible to play on the piano, you know? Um, and the directive was to, play what you can play mm. based on that you know so then then the the artist or and you know has to think about their own limitations in regard well, to the, the, yeah. Um, yeah and oftentimes uh surpass those limitations by figuring out you know this this strange stuff <laughs> so it's like it's uh so i do think consciously about that at times you know mm. i'm just in order to, uh, you, you know, try to try to figure out a situation that isn't just uh, me composing and somebody playing it, but, but yeah. challenging someone to maybe look at it even slightly different in order to bring some something else out. Yeah, yeah. How did you, you, you know, it's such a wonderful quartet, and how, I mean, you. I know you and Chad go way back, and uh, but how did you yeah. start playing with Chris? When was that connection? Well, I, you know, I was playing with Angelica Sanchez quite a bit, and yeah. and she, Angelica was actually Chris Davis's teacher for a while, um, oh, and Angelica had mentioned her, and I think there was something where Angelica couldn't play, and then I, I asked Chris if she'd like to play, and uh, it was just fantastic. So I brought her out to Marfa, where we recorded Desert and Crips. Mm-hmm. I live in Texas, and um, I was able to bring her out and Chad and Ingebrigt and have a week-long residency and work on this music and then wow, record good. it. And uh, uh, it worked out really well, and she's absolutely full of surprises and an amazing player. So um, uh, so we did that, and that continued, and the relationship continued, and then we had the opportunity to record this record for Rogart. So yeah. uh, we jumped studio again in Chicago with the, with the great Ken Christensen, who's an amazing uh, engineer in Chicago. And uh, we made Father's Wing and in just a couple hours in one day, mm. um, same kind of ideas, brought in the, these sketches and, and compositions and pretty much all one, one or I think they're all first or second day uh, sure. it's, it's, uh, yeah 
Yeah, it's a beautiful one. Yeah, I, I love this one. I don't know. It's just like somehow the tunes you wrote and the playing is just, yeah. I don't know. I listened to it too many, many times. So <laughs> beautiful Thank you. record. Yeah. Thank you. But uh, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, I've been following you for a long time and, uh, but I wanted to ask you some questions, like you know, from the first records, which were kind of straight aheadish. Then mm -hmm. some something must have happened in your brain. <laughs> I don't know what yeah. was it, but like, if I go even further back, you know, like who were some of the guys? You know, obviously you probably did the uh, Kenny Dorham, Lee Morgan, and all that jazz heritage. But like, when does the more free guys enter your scene, like Cornet, and I guess or? Bill Dixon, you mentioned, you know, and yeah, how was how well, was I that mean, story? I mean, when I was you know 15, 16 years old, and I started buying jazz records, the first record that records I bought was uh, uh, Miles Davis Bitches Brew, hmm. Charlie Parker Live at Birdland, and uh, Art Ensemble of Chicago Urban Bushmen. You know, pretty much because I liked the record covers and yeah. knew about some of the stuff, and everything sounded so incredibly different. I didn't understand why all of this music was called jazz because it was completely weird, different music from all coming from all those different angles. Um, and then in two thousand in two thousand in nineteen eighty one, I, I saw Sun Ra play live at the Sh Chicago Jazz Festival. Mm. You know, and I was and then and it was just a cathartic situation it blew me away and soon after i moved into the city because i the only thing on my mind was i, I wanted to play jazz so um i moved into the city and and uh some of the first people i played with were really into um more standard repertoire and like mm. uh uh, uh you know, all the Blue Note records, all the Prestige records, all the, you know, all that kind of stuff. So Early Miles and Art Farmer and yeah. Art Blakey. And, um, Fred I Roberts, I guess, yeah. A fanatic, and I was a fanatic about all this stuff. So I learned all these Miles Davis early solos and, and all of the, you know, his Blue Note records were astonishing both compositionally and, yeah. and, uh, and melodically. And also Kenny Durham, and I was a Lee Morgan freak. I love Blue Mitchell, you know, <laughs> Chet Baker. Um, also listening to Clifford Brown and Dizzy and Fast and Navarro and pretty much the whole history of, of, of the stuff. Learned plenty of solos and, and was really, uh, you know, I think because of circumstances, because of the people I met, I was, I, then I started playing standards and mm. blues and um, transcribing Art Blakey three horn arrangements and things like that. And had groups that that did that type of music, yeah. you know, all the way up, all the way up until. And this is the '80s. I moved into Chicago in 1983, so in 1983 to like 1992 or something, um, that's what I was doing. And then, mm. uh, then Jeff Parker came to town, and, mm. and some some other folks who were who were dealing with music uh, a, a little more. Uh, open or what we what would be considered more more improvised or creative yeah. music like you know um whether it was Ornette coleman or, or paul blay or you know um sun ra mm -hmm. uh, you know bill dix and all you know things like this art ensemble of chicago of course yeah, sure. and things like uh, all that and uh i i started doing that again and and but what really snapped was, you know, I had, a, I had, a, I was hanging out with Art Farmer, who, who I had a few lessons with, and he wanted to hear what I was doing. So um, he actually heard those first uh, two or three uh, jazz records I made because mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. wanted to hear hear that. So, so I gave them to him, and he said, "Come back tomorrow." And I came back the next day, and he said, "Listen, you you play jazz just fine, you know. You obviously know know the language and all of that, but." you can't you can't do this music and just sound like other people you know he said oh. you really have have to find your own voice and uh you know then he went one of the things he said that he did to, to try and find his own voice was to you know just uh he was talking about simple things but also more complex things but for him he, he simply he said he started 
doing things where he he would start his solo on on the absolute worst note possible in the chord, and and work work himself out of that, you know, and okay. uh, and I thought, wow, that's that's incredible because you know I'm thinking all these systems, and of course he was working within the the that Lydian system thing yeah. uh, too a little bit, but um, that was like wow, that's that's why Art Farmer has this thing and like this really kind of piquant strange lines that yeah, come yeah. out of his horn that are just like mesmerizing and uh but it was basically him also just saying you have to find your own voice you just can't so so i i was feeling that way anyway because i didn't want to just be some kind of imitator that can play the language and live in that i mm -hmm. was always composing i was i was always thinking of different ways of doing things, but it was just a uh, happenstance that uh, I was hanging out with Jeff Parker and some other people. And then uh, I made a, I made a complete break with playing uh, straight ahead jazz. And I just uh, uh, made an effort to open myself up through uh, more just uh, pure improvisation mm -hmm. and uh, strategies in order to, to open things up. Yeah. But a lot of that credit goes to goes to my friend Jeff Parker, who uh, who really uh, encouraged me to also move move towards that that way. And from I don't know what the year of nineteen ninety two or so, I, I started the Chicago Underground and, know, and, yeah. um, and just kept going, you know. And even to this day, I'm like I have the same attitude. I, I'm just still de desperately or calmly, you know. Let's call it the Zen Desperate. Um, <laughs> I love that. That's the title. I'm finding, stealing that one. <laughs> yeah, fi finding a way to, to open things up, and and not only just musically, but also spiritually, and uh, and you know the reason why we're even in this universe. You know, it's it's. I always have those questions, so um, my way of trying to answer them. And getting through that is not to just live in the mind, but actually make things. And that mm -hmm. goes back to what you said, what you asked me for. That's why I make things. It's it's uh, a spiritual quest as much as wanting to to uh, project light. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned Chicago Underground, and I, I think this is one of the most creative ensembles the last what twenty five years or even longer. You know what you guys did that's incredible and every album you know like it's from degrees of freedom on to whatever you do now like you know it's just like yeah. you always keep pushing it like you said but uh, i wanted to ask you you know how was the initial hookup with jeff and chad i mean how did you guys start playing and making music together you remember that when was the first time actually yeah, I mean, I mean, we started, we got together and played a little bit, and it felt really great. Um, I hooked up this situation at the Green Mill in Chicago. The Green mm. Mill is a famous yeah. jazz club in Chicago, and uh, we did Sunday afternoon workshops with the with the group. Um, so every Sunday we'd go in and and try this this new music that we're all writing and trying to make. Um, we also played at this place called Logan Beach, which was a, a small coffee shop that we would play every week as well. We just set up scenarios that, that we could uh, have these mm -hmm. kind of open workshops um, without the pressure of having to be like a concert, you know. Mm -hmm. They were called workshops for a reason, you know, and anyone could come. Almost anyone can come and play too, but it, it pretty much ended up being myself and Jeff Parker and Chris Lopes, the great bass player, he was there for a while, and Sarah P. Smith, who was a trombone player that was there for a while, and people like Josh Abrams and people mm -hmm. like Robert Barry from the Sun, you know, orchestra, and uh, um, and we just kept going and tried to develop this idea until like Delmark wanted a record of this, so. We went in and recorded that first record playground for them, and uh, uh, and just kept going. And the, I mean, the way the Chicago Underground duo happened was that uh, Jeff and a couple other players weren't available, and mm. me and 
uh, Chad just decided to uh, play together, just the two of us, at this place called Lunar Cabaret, which was a really cool spot just down the street from where I was living in Chicago. We set up one snowy night, and uh, that record just, like, burst out of us. You know, mm. we, we played all, all this stuff, and um, it just completely worked. And then, then because it worked like that, we... Uh, we released that one on Thrill Jockey, and that was the first yeah. Chicago Underground Duke record. You know, yeah. Twelve Degrees of Freedom. Yeah, yeah, I love that one. So it's, yeah. it's, all, it's all pretty. It's all just it was just a matter of just playing and trying things and things yeah. that worked. We kept going things that didn't work. Uh, we'll stop doing, you know. So uh, that's the simple answer, but that's yeah. that's the only. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. But yeah. did you immediately feel comfortable play in, in this more open context? You know, since you played like let's say more straight ahead jazz for a long time. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, pretty, I pretty much. I mean, it's it's still um, a very similar language. You, you yeah. need to know that stuff. As far as I'm concerned, oh, if you're going to call yourself a, a jazz musician, you absolutely need to know that stuff uh, backwards and forwards. Um, from my perspective, other people might argue that, but um, uh, I'm saying if you want to call yourself a jazz yeah, musician, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I don't call myself a jazz musician. I haven't for a long time. Creative music is better, but I just yeah. make things. So it's like it's so between, uh, you know, so-called noise music that I make to to, to songs with with. Emmett Kelly to, you know, drone pieces to, yeah. you know, uh, uh, sonic installations. I mean, it's, it's all, it's all just sound to me now, but back in those days it was, uh, you know, I basically stopped, uh, Worrying about I mean, well, I, I also stopped, you know, I, I, I transcribed plenty of miles and, and Clifford Brown and, you know, Blue Mitchell solos, you know, and, and, and learned them and did the best I could within that, uh, within that area. And I mean, mm. you know, nothing's, nothing is better or worse. It's just what you're interested in. You know, if you're right. interested in, in playing, uh, uh, you know, um, Bye Bye Blackbird your, your, your whole life and then finding new interesting ways to do that, there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Um, it's just that I didn't want to do that, you know, uh, I wanted to find something and I'm still trying to find something completely different just to, just to blow it open, man. You mm -hmm. know? And for me, that has to seemingly has to do more with intervals and dynamics and, and, uh, yeah. uh, uh, textures, you know, uh, things like that, you know, it has to do more with like, you know, high and low and like, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know color and, and uh feeling and uh breathing you know yeah. and silence. i don't i don't know it's makes sense yeah yeah uh, what, what about your you know chicago underground duo with chad and you guys have been playing together for what 25 years or longer actually not even uh, be long I, yeah. I first played with Chad when he was like, I think he was 15 or something or 16. Oh, okay. I don't know how old he was, but we ended up playing a little trio game with the great, uh, the great Chicago bassist Dennis Carroll. Oh yeah. Um, when, uh, um, oh man, I, you know, a really long time ago, and uh, that was actually the first time we played. Then years later, we we had hooked up with the with the Chicago Underground. Yeah. Right? When that took off, but we have a really long relationship, and he's on a lot of the records. And yeah, he's he's finally getting the attention deserved to him for years because I always felt he didn't get enough attention. But yeah, he's yeah. he's one of the greats, man. So it's like you know, um, just such a, a an incredibly dynamic but controlled uh, swing, and then groove and tempo and mm -hmm. and he's an amazing uh composer as well so yeah, uh, yeah. he's really a special uh special uh human yeah like i wanted to ask you like how do you keep 
you know, there, there, there were groups like Oregon or Modern Jazz Quartet or some other groups, you know, when players play together for 30 years oh. or longer. And oh. uh, how do you make, how do you still keep a spark in a musical relationship like that? And does he, you know, when you play with a person with same people through a long period, do they yeah. still surprise you? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, because there's evolution. These are people that that, that want to evolve, you know. Mm. So, I mean, the yeah. evolution of Chad exactly. Clay and even like Jeff Parker and the mm. the people that I surround myself with are, are seekers, you know. They're constantly doing doing new and interesting stuff themselves. So, by doing stuff away from uh, the Chicago underground, for instance, what yeah. you know, then we come back together. We have the, a whole new, new not a whole new, but but we have uh, uh, evolved in some kind of way to bring something else to the table, and uh, and then we try to use that something else in order to make something uh, um, truly beautiful and interesting. You know, at least in, the rule has always been like uh, we have to make when we make anything, it has to be at the very least interesting. <laughs> you know I mean? that's a good rule actually i mean to to all of us so yeah, so definitely. if one person thinks this this track that we did isn't it interesting then 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 it doesn't go on the record you know yeah. it's it's a it's very much a collective in that manner but usually we all manage to come up with something strange and different uh but also you know ha that has that chicago underground type yeah. of thing that that we don't consciously do but it's, it's just because we were the people that made that that sound you know that's that's quite cool actually that you, you can say that it's that sound when you hear yeah. you know chicago underground you actually know now it's yeah, you, guys. Yeah. you know what i mean it's like yeah like yeah it's hearing... not necessarily individuals it's more you it's it's a group sound which which i hope i you know, I, th I think it's the same thing for Exploding Star Orchestra and some yeah. other groups. Some yeah. So, how did you decide for you, you? You know, you know, jazz is already so it's quite a hard one financially and everything to make it work, and especially in small contexts. But like Exploding Star Orchestra is like that's a beast, man. <laughs> like, but yeah. how did how did you decide to do that one? Like, what 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 was the story? There actually. Uh, well, I mean, I I I had always wanted to write for a larger ensemble, and then the um, the city of Chicago uh, 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 and the Jazz Institute of Chicago uh, commissioned me to 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 write something mm. for a large ensemble, um, prefer preferably that highlighted different facets of the different scenes in Chicago, you know. Um, and I was kind of sort of lucky in that way because I, I, you know, knew people from the uh, whatever from, from the ACM from the and played with people from the ACM from from uh, like the North Side Chicago improvising scene from mm -hmm. from the post rock guys you know tortoise guys yeah. and all that and I seventeen and all that stuff and uh, uh, and other areas of interest. In the city, so uh, when they asked me to do that, I was already doing that, you know, j just kind of separately because I was yeah. also already making, you know, noise music and hanging out with Kevin Drum and like, you know, Jim O'Work was in town and David Grubbs and, you know, not to mention, uh, you know, of course N Nicole Mitchell yeah, and sure. like Jeff Parker and everything. You know, I don't think we have time to name everybody, but. Um, it was so it was really a beautiful thing that they asked me to do. So I put together this kind of disparate group and wrote music with that in mind, you know, and that became that first record. We are all we yeah. all come from, we yeah. are all from somewhere else. And uh uh John McIntyre uh from Tortoise engineered that record and also played on it and uh um it just turned out just, just beautifully and then it, it really worked and i think all the music on there too also is conducive yeah. of of the various uh situations but it's also coming from a very personal place 
you know, but but because they gave me the means to do that and yeah. suggested doing that, I thought it was beautiful because it's, you know, um, I don't know. I think eventually I might have thought that up, but that just gave me the, the impetus to um, to try that, and then it totally worked, and I just kept going with it. So now we're I don't know seven eight records in, and we're dimensional stardust dimensional. plus the last one, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, you still want to continue with the group? With, with... oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we just did concerts in Europe this last month, and uh, um, we're going to play three nights in São Paulo, Brazil, oh, in a man. couple of weeks. Nice. And then we're going to go to Skopje uh, really? Jazz Festival. Oh, fantastic! And so you should come over there. We're, we're going to be in Skopje on the thirteenth uh, uh, of October. Oh, I'm on tour. I start Where? a tour then, fuck, in Germany. Okay. Uh, the same. But, but, but it will be, uh, uh, you know, members of Exploding Star with, with this chamber orchestra that they have there. So I'm oh, writing wow. for all those. And then next year, there's going to be a new uh, Exploding Star 6. Well, now I think it's Octet uh, record. Um, that, that's going to come out an international anthem in March. Oh, and that's going to feature Angelica Sanchez, Craig Taborn, Gerald Cleaver, Nicole Mitchell. Oh, wow, man. Uh, who else is on there? Um, Damon Locks, of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mauricio Takara from Sao Paulo. So, so, yeah. And then I already have, <laughs> I already have a book of music for the next one after that, which is more of a more of an experimental opera that I'm working on. Oh, so, yeah. so that's going to come after that. So it's like, it's kind of, it's kind of a, uh, I don't know, man. It just keeps coming. So I'm going to do it while I can. Oh, man. <laughs> you know keep, I mean? keep doing it. Keep doing yeah. it. But, but you mentioned some of these guys, you know, like, even on, you know, Dimensional Stardust, that's like, J Jamie was on it, you know, who's yeah. Yeah. Past, you know and, and you yeah. know Tomika and Joe Ross, so you, you kind of it's not only Chicago guys, but it's like you know you're you're kind of connecting to also New York and everything. Oh, yeah. But how do you decide yeah, for yeah. the players actually in in an, in one of these well, part, versions? Let's it, say. I mean, it's mostly ju just when I start putting the music together from from these sketchbooks, um, I have ideas as to who who can play this i mean like for this upcoming record for instance uh it was definitely going to be two two uh someone on on that doubled wurlitzer and uh synthesizer you know mm -hmm. and uh i knew angelica could do that and then i thought of craig taborn because uh we had done something a long time ago but oh, really? um, oh, wow. we we've been in touch for a while so uh craig decided he would do it so um you know, and then uh, depending on the, the melodic structure of things, it worked best for guitar. So, of course, Jeff Parker's playing the guitar parts. And uh, uh, Nicole Mitchell, of course, yeah. you know. I, I just hear I just hear the instrumentation in my head, then I try to get those players. If I'm not able to get those players, then then, then it, it changes some, especially yeah. with live, live music. So... Um, because oftentimes these players are so incredibly busy with their own projects as mm -hmm. well that, that it's impossible to do everything. So, uh, for instance, the shows in, in Sao Paulo that we're going to do the first week of October um, is going to feature Brand, uh, James Brandon Lewis. And, and, oh, really? Uh, oh, man. And Luke Stewart's going to play bass. And, you know, Chad will be there and Michael Patrick Avery, who, who, who have played a bunch of the shows. Yeah. And a uh, uh, wonderful Italian vibraphone, Pasqual Mira, who you probably know. Yeah, yeah. Pasqual Mira plays. He plays a lot with Hami Drake. And, yeah, uh, and some other players. So, um, and that was mainly because a, a lot of the players from Dimensional Stardust were not available because because uh, sure. because Brazil asked me like two months before this festival if we can do something, and I said we can do something, but uh, you as long as you don't expect the dimensional stardust group. Um, so I'm using my Sao Paulo underground guys, Mauricio Chakara mm, yeah. and Guilherme Granado and, and uh, 
Thomas Roy, or some some great, uh, amazing players from there, and players from, um, in this case, with, uh, the only person coming from Chicago was Damon Damon Locks. You know, oh really? Oh okay. But, yeah, but I always envisioned the group as as not not a Chicago thing. It started in Chicago, but I want it to be more universal. So yeah. I, I've had European play, players playing group two. We did a version at the Berlin Jazz Festival with 10, 10 uh, Berlin musicians, you know, um, used some Polish musicians like Artur Majewski, you yeah. know, my good friend, trumpet player and, mm-hmm. and whatnot. And uh, uh, so I, I, you know, it's opened up to this probably, you know, at this point there's been 40 or 50 people that have come through the group That's you know? beautiful. at some at some point i want to get everybody you know what I'm saying? do like a super blowout of everyone that's played with the group and you know get 50 of us on stage and see what can happen you know? the big bank orchestra or something like that's, super yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic uh, oh uh, rob can, can we just get like... you in there man. oh man oh that would be such an honor uh, Rob, you know, like with the Exploding Star Orchestra, you basically got to play with some of your heroes, like Bill Dixon and Roscoe and a bunch of yeah. other guys. Like, uh, how did that happen? But you know, and how how was it with those guys? You know, those, those are those are my heroes. You know, and like, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've just basically asked them, but but it's more, you know. I guess it's a trust thing. It seems like with Bill, we had done a workshop together at the Guelph Jazz Festival oh, yeah. in in Canada, Canada yeah. and that 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 was our first meeting. So I was I was scared to death. I didn't I didn't even know why they were asking me to do a workshop with Bill. You know, I was like, I'll sit in the audience. You know, <laughs> they're like, no, 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 he, please. He he said it's cool. He wants to do it with you. So I was like, okay. <laughs> You know, the, the director of the festival said he, he said he knows your music and blah, blah, blah. I was like, you guys are crazy, you know. So uh, I showed up at the workshop and he had already started, you know, and there were a lot of people there. So I was like, OK, this is great because he's not going to even notice. He's just going to keep going. I'm going to sit in the audience <laughs> then I'm not even going to like go up there. And then five minutes later, he stops and he looks up and he. He's, he's like, is Rob Berserk in the audience? And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> so I said, yeah. He said, come up here. You're supposed to be up here. Why are you sitting in the audience? And I'm like, oh, well, I didn't want to disturb what was happening. And he was like, oh, okay. So, you know, it was, it was myself, and, and then there was a drummer and two other trumpet players, a saxophone player or something. So he continues to talk, and he was like, okay, so let's do this. And then he tells the saxophone player something to do, and he tells the trumpet players, then he tells the drummers. Then he looks at me, and I'm just like, he's going to, this is insane, you know? And he, and he looked at me, and he was like, Rob, I know you know what you're doing, so let's just, me and you will be together on, you know, within the realm of we know what we're doing. <laughs> wow, that's like, so cool. No, I, I, I'm like, no, I have no idea what I'm doing. I didn't say that. So that's that's how we met. And then an hour later, we're having lunch with him and his partner, Sharon, who's amazing. And um, we just hit it off really beautifully. And then he invited me to his house in Vermont mm. um, a couple months after that. And then I ended up staying like a month just at the, you know, me and my wife stayed at a, a just a cabin in the, in the Vermont oh, woods. Oh, yeah. And I would go to his house every day you know, for a month. And it was, it was incredible. Um, so finally, just from, I said, Bill, are you interested in, in playing uh, and recording with the, my exploding star orchestra? He was like, absolutely. Uh-huh. Let's do it. So that's how that started with Roscoe. It was, you know, uh, I didn't, of course I knew his music for years and I had uh-huh. met him a bunch of times, but finally I, I just simply called him up. I said, Roscoe, I love you. I love you and your music and everything. But would you consider playing with the Exploding Star Orchestra? And it was like, yeah, I've, 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 I've heard some of this, and yeah, I would love to do it. And he was oh. cool. Same thing with Fred Anderson. Oh, yeah, it was man, really man. the same thing with, uh, same thing with Pharaoh Sanders with, uh, with you know, 
the underground and stuff. He was yeah. super nice and open and like he was like, let's do it. You know, so um and with Roscoe was, you know, he came to the first rehearsal before the show. I think that was also in Berlin mm, wow. some years ago. Uh because uh, we did we did multiple shows with both of them. Um there's the one recording on Rogart with Roscoe on it and the one yeah. recording with Bill Dixon on Thrill Drive. But we had, we probably, I think we did five or six concerts each with both of them. And um, But the very first time with Roscoe, it was, you know, I was obviously nervous because I'm sure, like, man. I want to tell Roscoe what to play. This insanity, you know. And uh, But it, it, what was funny about it is that he, he sensed that immediately and was like, he just looked at me and he was like, Rob, I can tell you're a little nervous, but I'm a musician just like you. Just tell me what you want me to do, you know? Mm. And I That's and nice. I totally got rid of all of my anxiety and I just said, okay, <laughs> can you please play between these, these sections and blah, 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 and think of this while this is happening. And, and then, then it was uh, off to the races. And then there was no more nervousness and no more yeah. uh, so it's just kind of a I guess a kind of a, when you get these little spurts of uh, just you know some of these masters actually saying I believe in you and, mm. and that's why I'm here and uh, uh, do what you're doing I'm here to help yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah kind of yeah yeah it, it, it just frees things up and it makes it really really special and uh um and it was the same thing with art farmer same thing with you know fred hopkins same thing with, with, with mm -hmm. a lot of players that I was able to like play with get close to you know? yeah uh, are you comfortable in that role i mean you must be like you know when you lead like a dimensional stardust exploding star orchestra version and uh, yeah. you know all these guys in your in in the band, they're like incredible composers, improvisers, band leaders on their own, and yeah. then you're there, you know, conducting, telling what to play, directing. I mean, directing. Yeah, like, are you? How did you get used to being comfortable in that role, or are I you? Mean, not I mean, I <laughs> mean, no, I mean, the Exploding Star Orchestra has been going on for a long time. I yeah. think it's 15 years at this point or something or something close to that. Um, so it was, but I was, you know, uh, when I'm doing something like that and I, and I, it's it, it, before, yeah, there's some nervousness and stuff like that. But once I start, just like when I play, it becomes almost ritual, you know, I get in the zone and I'm just able yeah, to really cool. focus, focus in on it. And like, uh, say what needs to be said and because usually it's a situation where we don't have a lot of time if it's one rehearsal before a show then it's like uh, if you, I, I've learned that even if people start asking questions and they might want to change something I'm like very direct as saying yes or no I'm like yeah smart no okay let's keep going <laughs> or yes or you know whatever um, some people don't like that way of working, but you have to do it because then you're going to get stuck on, on one song for the entire rehearsal and then you rehearse nothing. So um, I kind of learned that early on. So because of that, I don't know. I, I mean, everyone in the band knows that I extremely respect them or they wouldn't be there in like everything they do. So I try to be as open as possible. And also uh, I, I like this technique of, I don't necessarily if something somebody does something that I don't quite think is right or like, I don't stop and and tell that person in front of everybody. Yeah. Usually while it's going on, I'll walk over there and whisper something in the ear. Just be like, Can you can you only do this here? You know? And then they feel that like kind of personal connection. And then that's not necessarily some kind of thing that you're calling somebody out in, in a in a in a group setting. You yeah, know? yeah. So, uh, so if that's one technique that I've learned to, that, that really is, is beautiful. And it also helps me to connect to people in a more direct way by doing yeah. that. 
So it's not just a group playing my music. It's individual personalities and people that I love that are that are trying to elevate the music to hopefully something uh, better than I than I've written or conceived. Yeah. You know? so how have you learned this? Like the band leading, I mean, and did I don't the, know, man. the grades give you also some advice, like, or like how to lead a band or like the musicians you uh, played with or. Yeah. I mean, I got some, some interesting advice from Bill Dixon, for instance, you mm -hmm. know, um, uh, just about m mostly just being uh, confident is a confidence thing. You can't be not confident in front of 15 people okay. they're going to sense that and then um you might even lose some respect because of that because they're going to think you don't know what you're doing yeah. um but it's it's mostly stuff i learned from just trial and error you know at one point um because i used to see people directing a group for instance and somebody would say something like I don't understand this part. Can you explain it to me? And it was evident that the leader did, did, didn't know uh, his or hers own music. You know what I'm yeah, yeah, that's shitty. Yeah, okay. And sometimes people write impossible stuff and they don't even know what they're writing. It's like, what? Um, so I learned very early on. I, I learned all the parts of everybody. You know what I'm saying? So if someone says, what's up with this? Can you play with? There, there was a classic thing that happened early on in the group, you know? With the first record, with the we we're all from somewhere else record, where uh, Nikki Mitchell, there was a very tricky passage in one of the songs that was in unison with me, and uh, I was directing it, so, so she was playing it alone, and she was like, uh, "Rob, do you play this passage with me? I'm not quite sure if I'm, you know." And so I, so I counted off. I picked up the trumpet and played it exactly what it was with her and then she looked kind of stunned and surprised a little bit and then it clicked to me it was like oh she's she's checking me to see if i know my own music and i said you want to play it again and she was like she's like yeah let's play it one more time and i counted it and played it one more time perfectly with her and then she was like oh okay thank you <laughs> and i was just like okay let's move on you know you know it was like but that's the first time that someone had uh which I was lucky because it was during the very early stages of the group yeah. um, that I was like, oh, okay, you know, uh, uh, put a star after that. Uh, no, just like I did, know all your music all the time. In case someone calls you out, you just nail it, and then you get a little more respect because yeah. uh, they know that you know what's going on. You know, yeah, so, important. so yeah. but that was like. A trial and error thing you know it wasn't no one told me that but i just saw that and i was like okay because if i wasn't able to play that uh, that would have been very embarrassing oh yeah sure. that's beautiful yeah so, that's beautiful yeah it's just to learn all the time these things yeah I, i love asking these questions you know being put in a role of a band leader it's always quite stressful especially yeah. you know you, yeah. you get musicians you really admire or you know yeah. re respect and then you're like well can we like <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> I, i found myself find myself sometimes in these situations that i'm like man i would love to listen to you just play but <laughs> you know yeah i guess yeah. i should jump please, in now please, yeah. <laughs> you know but, yeah. uh, do you have a large ensemble as well yeah i did some some larger like like 12 piece and i did some with string orchestras and that oh, nice classical and that was that was funny because you know yeah. the classical musicians <laughs> it's a you whole know, other thing it's a whole other thing <laughs> it was really tricky music like lots of odd meters and improvised mm. sections also and then mm -hmm. I, was just, i was just like yeah guys you know this is just an improvised section you just play free there uh, uh, all of them were like well, what uh, do you mean like you know what what is this <laughs> like ah oh, okay <laughs> Then I had to write, to write down on. phrases, yeah, and like, like, but yeah, but it's funny, yeah. I, I love that that moment. But, live, uh, live, live and learn. <laughs> yeah, all the time, all the time. But yeah, I wanted to ask you, like, you know, you're coming to Europe in uh, October. You said to Skopje. What, what about uh, yeah the future projects? Like, you know, you mentioned you have like two exploding stars kind of ready, and uh, an opera, and uh -huh. 
what else do you still have like planned for the next couple of months regarding touring also and um i'll do an installation in tenerife in tenerife really uh, canary oh. islands It's a beautiful festival though there called Karakson Festival. Yeah. And I've been going there for years for my friends, so they want me um, for this experimental opera. It's an experimental opera and also an installation. So um, I've been making these giant screen sculptures oh, okay. um, that get projected on and the projections are controlled by sound. You know? Oh, wow. Beautiful. So um, um, simple premise, but, but I, I found that The screen material that I'm working with is excellent for projections because you can project on it, in it, and through it. So it's like I've been working with this within, in my art practice for a few years. And I just had an exhibition in Milan last week. Mm -hmm. um, but there'll be another exhibition in Marfa this next week with the same kind of materials. And then I'll do the thing in Tenerife at the end of October. And then, uh, shit, man, just a couple solo things out oh, to the end of the year. Oh, fantastic. And, What about the uh, quartet? Are, are you planning to tour with the quartet? With the... Uh, not as of yet. Chris okay. Davis has been extremely uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, busy, you know, because she teaches as well and, and has multiple projects and she's yeah. won these awards. So everybody wants her. And, uh, exactly. Yeah. Um, I keep I keep asking her, you know, every now and then to see if she can do something, and uh, um, she's up for anything if she's available. Oh, but sure. it hasn't been. Um, I haven't really planned next year so much, although I'm forgetting stuff because I know I have this stuff. And I mean, there'll be the record release party for the new Exploding Star record in March, where okay. we'll, we're going to do the concert at the. Adler Planetarium at a planetarium in Chicago. Oh, yeah. And we're going to project on the dome ceiling, so it should be pretty interesting. Oh, you know? yeah, fantastic. Kind of want to, I kind of want to do a tour of only planetariums. Oh, <laughs> man. That would Or be killing. Tours, you know? That would be killing. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see. There must be one in, is there one in Maribor? <laughs> For sure in Ljubljana. Right? In Ljubljana? Shit, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, There's got yeah. It would be cool. That's a good idea, actually. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Cool. Great. Cool, Rob. And, you know, I'll leave you a nice Florida afternoon Sunday now. <laughs> so, okay, man. Thank you, man. Thanks for sharing some of the thoughts. You know, I really appreciate it taking the time. Yeah, well, it's a, a pleasure to uh, talk to you. And, uh, Yeah.